Well, thank you. And it's good to be back for the, the second hour of 24 Reasons for Hope. And in this hour, we're going to focus on the relationship between solar electricity and the kind of electricity that most people use now, which is mostly generated from coal. For many years, cost was the barrier to the adoption of solar electricity. But here's the great news. That barrier is falling down, just like the Berlin Wall fell down it, or was taken down. And in this case, the engineers and scientists have done so much work that they're reducing the cost so that that barrier is falling. In fact, in many parts of the world, solar electricity is now cheaper than or equal to the price of electricity from dirty sources of energy, principally fossil fuels. From solar panels on rooftops in Bangladesh to large-scale solar farms in the American Southwest, solar electricity is increasingly coming to dominate the supply of new electricity generation all around the world. Now, this is a fundamental change. It's unprecedented. And indeed, it is strengthening every single day. This trend is really taking hold. We have entered the era of solar electricity. Now, in the last hour, we showed how uh, the, well, we're, we're going to talk about the cost of roof, rooftop solar in relation to utility rates. In the last hour, we showed a number of examples of how the installations of photovoltaic energy uh, increased very slowly, but then they jumped up, and this last year in the U.S. and this year in the U.S. is projected to grow even faster. And we showed how the cost uh, is coming down very, very rapidly. Now, we are nearing a tipping point. What is a, a tipping point? I think we all know, but here's a, a, a very a familiar uh, uh, example. But first of all, this uh, large financial institution says there may be a tipping point where customers for electricity get off of the grid and get their electricity from solar panels instead. In fact, a lot of the electric utility companies in their conferences and when they talk among themselves, they're comparing themselves actively to the old landline telephone companies, and they're talking in their phrase about a utility death spiral. Well, uh, it doesn't have to be that, but we do need to make this transition quickly, and we need to find a way to make it work. But here is a familiar tipping point. The difference between 32 degrees and 33 degrees is a difference of more than one degree. And for most of the world that is in the, on the metric system, the difference between zero degrees at freezing and one degree, again, is a difference of more than one degree. It's, it's the difference between ice and water. Now, in the business world, there is a similar tipping point between more expensive than and cheaper than. That's the difference, not of just a degree, it's a difference between markets that are frozen up, as solar markets used to be, and markets that are liquid with lots of investment and lots of customers, lots of new purchases of solar panels, and that is what we're seeing now. We are already at a point, as of this fourth quarter of 2014, where the price of electricity from photovoltaic solar energy is equal to or cheaper than the price from other sources in 79 countries. You heard uh, Mark Ruffalo um, and Sam Champion in the last hour using this phrase grid parity. All that means is that's the average price of electricity from all other sources. And when solar reaches that point, that's grid parity. And when it starts to go below that point and is cheaper than the electricity from other sources, then the world changes. Let's look at which countries uh, have already reached solar grid parity. As of 2014, there are a lot of island nations in the Caribbean uh, and in the Pacific uh, that bring this number up to 79 countries. 
But here's the thing, it keeps coming down in price every year. As, as I said in the last hour, uh, the price of electricity from fossil fuels is going up, the price from solar energy is going down. Within just the next six years, we're seeing all of these other countries reach grid parity. And in fact, more than 80% of all the people in the entire world will be able to buy electricity from solar panels on their rooftops at a price that's equal to or cheaper than what they can buy electricity uh, from, uh, from other sources. This is really exciting. And then it keeps on going because every year or two it comes down uh, an, another 20% or so. And some of the countries uh, that you, you don't see reaching grid parity are not uh, uh, failing to reach grid parity because the solar electricity is more expensive in, in those countries. Take Egypt, for example. They subsidize the fossil fuels. So uh, we need to not only encourage a more rapid adoption of this wonderfully hopeful new source of electricity, solar uh, photovoltaics, we need to get the world to stop subsidizing the use of the dirty fuel. $600 billion per year is now being spent by governments around the world to subsidize the polluting of the air uh, and the other environmental problems and security problems that are associated with fossil fuels. If it weren't for that, there would be solar grid parity virtually everywhere in the world very, very quickly. But we're going to get to 80% of the world's people in six years anyway. And that is a very, very hopeful sign. Uh, in, and, and when you look at the new electric generating capacity that's being added in the United States in the first uh, three months of, of this year, almost three quarters of all of the new electricity generating capacity came from solar electricity. That shows that it really is uh, the wave of the future. In fact, the U.S. is now installing one new uh, PV system uh, every four minutes. Now, this is an interesting story. Some people saw that some people who live in Minnesota certainly followed this, but they had a public process to put out bids for new electricity generating capacity. And it went to a neutral, nonpartisan, objective, uh, administrative law judge to make the decision. Oh, and there were proposals to use natural gas and other kinds of fossil fuel. And by the way, Minnesota, you know, is right on the Canadian border. It's pretty far north. Well, solar proved itself on the merits and won that competition. Uh, and the judge said that's the greatest value uh, to the ratepayers in Minnesota, solar energy, solar electricity. Uh, in Australia, now more than one out of every 10 homeowners has already installed a photovoltaic electric panel on his or her roof. We're seeing this uh, particularly in the developing countries. Look at Bangladesh. In the last hour, I talked about the example of how these developing countries adopted mobile phones so quickly because they never had the, the landline phones uh, in, in the first place. Well, there are lots of people in Bangladesh and in India, by the way, 400 million people who have no electricity whatsoever. So along come these uh, new cheap solar panels uh, and they're, they're buying them up like hotcakes, as we used to say. Uh, in Tennessee when I was a kid. Uh, Bangladesh is installing rooftop solar photo, photovoltaic panels at a faster rate than the people of any country in the entire world. This is what uh, the adoption of PV uh, in Bangladesh looks like. Now, <laughs> the news, the good news gets even better. One of our most respected research, uh, business research institutions in the United States did a big study of this. And this sounds a little bit like gobbledygook, but let me translate it here. What they say is that by within a decade, we are likely to see energy price deflation. We're likely to see the price of energy start to go down significantly. 
as solar electricity and wind electricity start displacing more of the electricity from the dirty fossil fuels. So we not only help to solve the climate crisis, we not only clean up the air pollution that is creating such problems in this country and every country in the world, we also see a decline in the cost of energy, and that means a boost to the economy and the creation uh, of more jobs. And we're going to be talking about that uh, in a future hour. So already in Germany, in northeastern Australia, uh, in California, there have been a significant number of days in which the cost of electricity, because of this abundance of solar uh, panels, has gone down to zero and even below zero. So this energy price deflation is an extremely hopeful sign for the economy uh, as well as for the environment. But think uh, again for a moment about what it means to be at the threshold of a tipping point when everything changes. Going back for a moment to those mobile phones, I spoke to a group of young people in a large audience recently, and I asked for a show of hands. How many of you uh, have stopped buying telephone service from the landline company and just use mobile phones? And more than three quarters of them raised their hands. And an increasing number of older people are doing that too. Well, think about what a surprise that has been in the economy and uh, in our lives. Now project forward a little bit and imagine a time less than 10 years from now where there is a similar audience uh, and you ask how many of you have canceled your contracts for electricity from the coal-fired electric generating company and rely solely on solar panels and renewable energy and energy storage. And, and when a majority of hands go up to answer yes to that question, that will be the sign that we have crossed the tipping point. Now there's also a tipping point between despair and hope. And uh, some people go from climate denial straight to climate despair without pausing on the intermediate step of actually allowing themselves to hope and actually solving the problem that we're confronted with. So before I close out the presentation in this hour, let me put this entire issue in a broader context. I've come to believe that there are really only two questions that people have had in their minds about the climate crisis and the opportunities inherent in solving it. Number one is, do we really have to solve the climate crisis? After all, the world gets 85% of its energy from uh, coal and oil and, and gas. Uh, it's been a long run. Looks like it might be hard to make that change. Do we really have to do it? Well, of course, in previous uh, 24 hours of reality presentations, we've laid out a lot of the reasons why the climate crisis is causing extreme weather events, dirty energy creates dirty weather. But regardless of what any person says, Mother Nature has now begun to answer that first question for us very powerfully. And the answer is yes, we have to change because the extreme weather events are getting worse with the fires and the droughts and the floods and the sea level rise and the spread of tropical diseases and all that parade of horribles. Mother Nature is telling us in unmistakably clear terms, yes, we have to solve this. But that brings us finally to the second question. If we have to solve this crisis, can we solve it? If people don't have hope that we can, then that results in political paralysis and people don't do anything. This year's 24 hours of reality is an answer to that second question. But again, the answer doesn't come from any of us as individuals. It comes from what is happening in the world. We are seeing this revolution take place. 
Solar electricity is now competitive in more countries around the world and will soon be competitive everywhere. That's the second reason for hope in this year's 24 hours.